Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to Avid Online, a series launched on April 2020 in a direct response to the pandemic so we could continue to bring to you the best from the world of art and culture. For those who are joining us for the first time, a special welcome. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid Learning, our partners and speakers for this evening's discussion. The platform for our interactions may have changed, but we stay true to our mantra as always that learning never stops and this evening will be no different. Sometimes I can't believe that it's been nearly two years and in all those months paralyzed by the pandemic, households began to learn to operate in digital spaces. But it really makes me happy to see something very interesting happening, especially around the cultural residencies. And that brings us to the reason we curated the session today and the topic at hand. The Italian Cultural Center Mumbai, Tark and Avid Learning present Residencies Across Borders, a discussion on the importance and the evolution of residencies and how they are key to a new world of associations between artists and cultural institutions. I don't want to diverge too much and leave it to our expert panel to unveil the new approaches of curating residencies, but I'm delighted to welcome and give them a warm virtual welcome, architect and co-founder SQW Lab, Goto Katsushi, administrator of the Inlak Shiv Dasani Foundation, Amita Malkani, author, poet, co-curator of Bridge of Stories, Sumana Roy, artist and co-founder, SQW Lab, Vish Fashraf, author and co-curator of Bridge of Stories, Matteo Travasani, and they will be in conversation with art writer, Rima Gihai. They will examine how residencies have inspired unconventional collaborations and discuss what will it take for our culture not to survive but to thrive in the face of lockdowns, limitations of distances and difference in time zones. Today's session will last 75 minutes followed by a 15-minute Q&A in which Rima will be taking questions. So do keep them posted throughout in the Q&A box. Over to you Rima. Very excited for the session to begin. Thank you once again for joining in. Uh, thank you, Asad. And um, I'd like to welcome my panel uh, here. Um, just some opening lines, uh, thoughts uh, before we begin our discussion. Um, I was in conversation with actor and theatre director Atul Kumar this morning. And uh, we were speaking about residencies. Um, to him, according to actor and uh, theater director Atul Kumar, who runs an artist residency in Calm Shape, he says residencies, and I, and I thought this was quite beautiful, that they are spaces that allow the artists to both fail and flourish. Having attended many residencies in India, Atul was most inspired by the legendary Veena Pani Chawla's Adi Shakti Theater Arts Laboratory, for theater arts research in Pondicherry. He hopes to create and offer a similar space of serenity where an artist hasn't fallen prey to commercial demands. He says, you know, these are spaces for creation and experimentation. Using his words uh, as a pretext, if I may say, let me begin this discussion by starting with you, Vishwa and Goto. And if you could speak about, um, you know, um, your project uh, in Bombay and Coventry, the Square Labs Laboratory. And if you could take us through this and uh, let's start our discussion with that. Otto, do you want to pull it up? Yep. Can you go to the first slide, please? So SQW Lab was set up in 2018 and we're kind of new at this and rigging it every year anyway. So when it came to the lockdown, it was just another kind of uh, rig. But uh, essentially what we've been thinking about is having a peer group conversation. It's something we've missed greatly after leaving university and, you know, kind of being, the, I've always been in this 
place where sometimes I'm also beneficiary of residencies, and then sometimes I'm I'm programming them. And this is when the so when it came to SQW Lab, we really really brainstormed on what it is that we wanted to be, and we thought the best way where Koto and I came uh, intersected was on home and domesticity and how we live and how this uh, affects us as uh, producers. So uh, also we collaborate with uh, Charlie Levine and uh, Rosanna Van Merlo, who are, are also our co-founders. Okay. Can you go to the next, next slide, Gautam? And the premise that we work on in order to facilitate these uh, collaborations or peer group conversations is that we design play projects, which are essentially small briefs um, that allow us for 10 days to kind of quickly come up with ideas, ideate on things, make little process drawings um, or process projects as we call them sometimes. Can you go to the next slide, Putu? So the things that we've explored so far is um, tale tellers, where we explore um, texts and films and um, see what visuals we come up with within their domestic investigations. The ideas of still life, um, the ideas of communication, slow communication through postcards, tall houses. Next slide, please. Um, how we eat, how we dine. That's something that Goto and I have been very, very interested in. And Goto has also designed our space to make our dining and cooking like the central central activity, so to speak. Uh, looking at a, another text that we've looked at is Tender Buttons by Gertrude Stein, uh, how memory works within homes and how we kind of explore the idea of curating homes, either personally or as a formalized curated space. Can you go to the next slide, Goto? So this year, with the lockdown, we were not able to do the physical 10-day workshop that we usually do. But uh, go to the next slide, please. Charlie Levine had been working on a play project, uh, which was looking at Frank Baum's book, The Show Windows, a journal to window trimmings for merchants and professionals. And um, she, is, she was invited by Coventry City Council, um, which is this year's, I think, uh, Art Council England or something like this, some other government UK body, which I'm not sure what it was, uh, picks a city of culture every year. So 2021, Coventry is the city of culture. And uh, Charlie was invited to do a project of with shop windows in Coventry where she's looking at this text and giving artists small briefs to work with. Can you go to, can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, no, can you go back one slide, in fact? And we thought that in the absence of kind of us being able to hold it in our space, it made a lot of sense to somehow make it more public where you know people could still see what the artists were working on, but at the same time, our the restrictions of COVID and our building and all of this would not have allowed everyone to come over from abroad or anywhere else for that matter. And um, also our building would have gone completely nuts if we'd had 10 people jumping about. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, we decided to pick six artists for Bombay, Four of them, as we always do, pick a plus one for ourselves. Uh, and then we approached that when we said, you know, we're a little bit out of our depths here. We've never done a public art project before. And Tark got very excited. And is amazing at supporting all her artists in various, various ways. Um, and so Tark jumped on board and they kind of, in a way, are very much perhaps worked much harder than we have in putting it together in the physical spaces and talking to the shops and all of this. So in Bombay right now, we have three artists who are showing. 
That is um, Avantika Bhava, who is showing at Love Mill. And then we have Mario D'Souza, who is showing at uh, Isaji Atelier. And we have Samantha Patra showing at Raw Mango. But at the same time, three of the past SQW lab uh, fellows, as we like to call them, we are showing in Coventry. So there is me showing um, at a hostel, and there is uh, Samir Gulagur showing also in Coventry, and Adam Nathaniel Furman showing in Coventry. And for all the logistics of doing this one with, you know, uncertainties of lockdown and everything, we broke down the six artists into three and three in Bombay. So what's coming up next is uh, Tarla Patel, uh, Emma Chich, I, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, and Ranjit uh, Kandal Gaonkar. So that's what's happening. And we've had a lot of partners to do this, to actually pull this off. So of course, Tark has been amazing and doing a lot of it. And there is Isaji, Raw Mango, La Mil, Coventry City of Culture, Reba, uh, West Midlands, and the Arts Council England, who've all supported the project here and in Coventry. So. Amazing. So that's it. Yes. Amazing. And when are the, uh, the three uh, upcoming artists uh, going to be showing their work? When and where? In January. And it will again be Isaji Atelier, Raw Mango, and a space that is behind uh, Kemald. What's that school? Uto, what's the school? Uh, cathedral. cathedral. So there is a building near Cathedral called KK Chambers. And that's. Uh, okay. Lovely. Uh, you know, um, both of you, uh, Matteo, Sumana, both of you are working on something exciting with your literary project, uh, Bridges of Stories. Um, would, you all, would you be able to tell me a little more about this? Uh, I go. Uh, I go. <clears throat> thank you. Th thank you for uh, having us tonight, uh, today. Um, Bridge of Stories is um, an online writing residency uh, promoted by um, the Cultural Institutes of New Delhi and uh, Mumbai. Um, from the idea of the two directors, uh, Andrea Baldi and Francesca Amendola. The, the residency uh, started in, uh, at the end of June um, 2021 uh, when me and uh, Shumana Roy, that uh, is uh, with us to, today, uh, mm -hmm. asked uh, uh, 12 writers, both uh, Indian and uh, Italian, um, to write a short story that will be, uh, at the, the end of the project uh, of Bridge of Stories, uh, will be translated into the, into the other language. Um, the aim of the project is um, a book that uh, will be published uh, in, uh, in India in a bilingual uh, edition. Um, an important fact is that uh, all the writers are um, first-time uh, authors. We wanted to use this project to give them the opportunity uh, to be published and for the first time and to be read by a very um, uh, wide uh, audience. Uh, me and Shumana um, have chosen them by seeking out the, the most important, the newest voice in uh, our two countries. Uh, we chose the, the stories and we worked uh, alongside with the, with the authors uh, in uh, editing sessions. Um, to to bring the, the the best of them on the on the on the page. Um, the the another aim of the project of the residency is uh, the interaction between uh, between the the writers um, because the interactive aspect uh, is uh, the main purpose uh, of a bridge of stories, Ponte di Story, uh, to the promotion of the Italian uh, uh, culture. Uh, and the Indian as well. Um, I hope that um, this, this residency 
we bring uh, um, something new in the in the public of these uh, two two countries uh, in the cultural institution to, um, to 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 promote yes the 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 the, the cultural institu institution both Indian and uh, and Italian. Uh, may I add to that, uh, Rima? Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I think uh, Matteo has done a much better job of introducing the project than I could have. Uh, Matteo, uh, like myself, Matteo teaches creative writing and is also the editor of a very influential literary magazine uh, in Italy. Uh, there was a slight difference in the way we went about in our, um, in the way we selected um, the writers, uh, Mathieu, for instance, I remember from one of our interactions when the writers were meeting, the six Italian writers and the six Indian writers were meeting online for the first time. Matteo said that um, he had chosen uh, writers who had the most, who he thought were the most imaginative among the young writers, not young, sorry, but first time or unpublished writers. Uh, that he was reading at this moment uh, in, you know, in cultural history. Uh, mm. I think um, I went about this slightly differently, Rima. Um, I, I edit uh, a magazine myself and like Matteo, I teach creative writing. So I, I wanted to be sure that I was not being partial to my students at Ashoka University where I teach because uh, I know that, you know, I always, every semester I get fantastic writers in class. Uh, but I didn't want this to be, you know, biased in favor of my students. Uh, hmm. Having said that, there are uh, two students from Ashoka University, two former students. Uh, both, of, both of whom actually I never taught. They had graduated by the time I began teaching there. Uh, but I also brought in something uh, that I was conscious of during the process of selection of the writers. One had been given to us by Francesca and Andrea that, was, uh, that they were to be unpublished writers. I decided to go for uh, amateur writers as well um, and to kind of not narrow down the description of unpublished writers to young writers, which is usually the case in any publishing environment. So you have lists on like, you know, writers under 25, writers under 30, writers under 40. Uh, coming from the kind of provincial setup like I do, being a woman, also uh, because of various caste backgrounds and class backgrounds, I knew that many many of us begin very late and um, particularly women they give themselves the permission to write begin writing very late and i wanted people who were amateurs and did not necessarily think of them as professional writers to be able to partake of this opportunity um, that domestic life and its trappings and bonds and bondages might not allow them to uh, you know, travel to a different place. Two of the, the, them are mothers. One of them is a medical practitioner. Two yes. of them actually are medical practitioners and would not be able to, re, uh, you know, leave their practice to avail of a residency in a place far away from their um, clinics, uh, as it were. Uh, so that was also a criteria that kind of played uh, a surely a primary and definitive role in the way I went about selecting these writers. Right. Uh, you know, things are very different now that we have transitioned into this hybrid working space, right? So does this, A, this is a long distance format, like a project. Uh, secondly, the format has moved online. Um, you know, does um, that still provide the creative possibilities offered by traditional formats? Matthew, should I? Please. Uh, uh, Rima, um, I'll share with you uh, the experience that I have had and then try to relate it to uh, the advantages and disadvantages our contributors to this proposed anthology might have faced. Uh, I have benefited from two residencies 
uh, in uh, in 2000 yeah we are still in 2021 uh, so yeah in uh, this year uh, one of these was um, at harvard university um, this was a month's project at dumbarton oaks where which i would have loved to visit um, because of its obvious gardens and uh, the kind of exposure that I would have really enjoyed over the summer, but that was denied to me because of COVID and, mm -hmm. you know, everything related to visa. Um, what moving, so what Harvard did was they moved this online. What that meant was I was awake till about 1.30, 2.30 in <laughs> the night. Um, I was very grateful for, you know, other people in the residency kind of looking out for me and saying, oh, she must be very sleepy, let her go make her presentation before us and so on. But um, I have, I've been in other residencies before uh, of a similar nature, but this was certainly the most uh, enthusiastic and supportive group uh, that I found uh, among all the residencies that I have been in. I think... Uh, Zoom, the Zoom life, the Zoom residency has allowed a certain dimension of interaction that might not have been possible. When I was in Munich, for instance, I remember I did not know who my co-residents were. We did not really have to meet them except, you know, once over a lunch or dinner. Here we were meeting every uh, their morning, my night. Uh, so that was also the kind of, I think, uh, when I say dimension, Another kind of dimension uh, that has been added to us, uh, to our kind of system, I think, is a natural reaching out to the person next to us in the square. So I see Mateo and all of you beside me and uh, Vishwa and Amita and Sagar. There's a kind of uh, passing the mic, as it were, uh, yes. that might not have been possible had we been in separate office spaces. That I have benefited from and enjoyed. Uh, this, unfortunately, because um, of the, you know, kind of hurried, slightly hurried nature of our project, uh, Matteo and I could not always provide to our contributors. Francesca and Andrea, uh, I think, um, Matteo, correct me if I'm wrong, um, have visualized this as a kind of annual project. And I think Matteo and I both agreed that in the future, instead of kind of selecting um, the kind of writers who just happen to be in our range of vision, we would prefer a call for submissions, a call for, res you know, um, whatever, a, a kind of that would allow um, more people to know about this and more people to apply um, as well. Matteo, uh, please uh, correct me if I've said something I should have. You said it right. It's right. I think that uh, this is the only way possible to to uh, to make this uh, to make this, uh, this this project right because uh, this is the, the, the virtual and um, the across borders uh, residency is the only possible format uh, for a residency like this uh, because the it's like the the it's like if the the, the space between the the, the writers. Um, is filled by uh, this this experiment, and um, the, the, the the immediacy of the of the of the interaction um, is uh, is is re retreating when the, when uh, when we face the, for, for example the, the obstacle of the of the language. We, uh, so. Uh, from one side, we have the immediacy of the of this kind of uh, of work, of this kind of uh, interaction, wise interaction between uh, between us, between them, between we and Andrea and Francesca. But uh, there is uh, another step, not so immediate. Um, the, that uh, there is the importance of the of the translating of the trans of the, the translation. So on the other side, uh, we have uh, an immediacy and. Uh, a time that is, um, on the contrary, mediated by this uh, by this time to make the um, the connection possible. 
um, because more time is needed to to ensure that the, the complexity of the of the writing uh, uh, is uh, brought to to everyone, which is uh, which is why the, the the work of the of the two translators, uh, one from Italian to English and English from Italian, is, right. uh, is so important. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Amita, I'd like to bring you here. You know, Inlax Shivdasani Foundation has supported so many artists over the decades, um, you know, uh, towards degree programs overseas. Um, but over the last few years, Inlax has been also supporting artists to uh, pursue residencies, both in India and abroad. Um, you know, why do you personally or Inlax as a foundation believe that uh, residencies are important for artists and how do you see that contributing to an artist's repertoire? Um, well, let me start with that. Inlex is primarily a scholarship awarding foundation, as you right. said, and our um, supporting residencies arose as a response to the need of the time. So what we found is in the 80s and 90s, we had a collaboration with RCA. We were sending artists every year for two-year master's programs, and it was all going well. Come the early 2000s, and we found that artists didn't want to go for two-year programs anymore. The art scene was beginning to boom in India, and nobody wanted to be away for more than three to six months. So we said, I mean, we wanted to continue supporting artists, um, trying to pack them off for long-term programs wasn't working. So we started with supporting them at um, overseas uh, residencies. So we, um, we've got collaborators in, in the US, in UK, in Italy. Um, and because that was so successful, we also started supporting um, artists at residencies within the country as well. Um, in fact, there is a, Dhwani, can you just share the slight thing? I mean, I, I just put together some images just for you all to get an idea yeah. of the kind of institutions we've uh, sent artists to. Um, so, for example, Delfina. Now, Delfina, we've been sending artists to for years on end. Um, um, we do this in collaboration with the Charles Wallace Trust. Um, so we're three partners, basically, Delphine of the Charles Wallace Trust and ourselves. And every year we send an artist or a curator to this space. Can we have the next slide? Then we have Gasworks. This is also, again, very, very popular. We, this, this, we have the same collaboration in this space. We've been spend, uh, sending artists here for many years as well. Um, next, please. Um, we have the Darling Foundry in Montreal. This came on board about six, seven years ago, so comparatively recently. This has been a very, very successful residency as well. Um, we found that a lot of artists who've gone here, when they've come back, their practices have really taken off. And probably our oldest collaboration has been with UniD, which is, uh, which is in Biela in Italy. Um, they've changed their formats over the years, but we've been sending artists to UniD. This was the exception for at least 20 years or longer. Okay. And... Um, um, They've, they've changed their format now. It's, it's, a, it's a shorter, like a six-week program compared to earlier. It was like three months. Um, next, please. Yeah, and, and then there are a lot of um, um, residencies overseas which I've not spoken about. We have Skohagen in um, North America. Then we have ICP in New York. We have Mailer and Lewitt also in... Um, in uh, uh, Italy. Um, we've we, what we also do is we you know some programs like the Reichs Academy, like Ashkel Alwan in Beirut. Um, they support the artists quite a bit, but sometimes uh, there's a small shortfall which the artist needs to be filled up. So we're happy to step in there as well. Um, mm -hmm. All the other, uh, most of our all the other spaces we 
float the coals ourselves. As uh, Sumana was saying, um, you know, that, you know, floating open coals, 90% of our residencies are all open coals. It's just at Rikes and Ashkal, if someone's already got a space there, if we feel they're very deserving and they, they have a shortfall, then we fill that gap. All right. Um, then in India, we've had many tie-ups with What About Art, uh, which sadly has closed down HH Art Spaces in Goa, which has taken on many different avatars. Um, and um, one Shanti Road, which is still going strong. Um, it's actually really tragic, but Today, we have more collaborations with existing residencies overseas in India. The crying need for the hour at the moment is to have more residency spaces in India. But because there's such a um, constraint on space, you know, so unless you can be innovative like Vishwa and Goto have been and have people giving you spaces, having a full-time residency, is real. We, we've seen so many fold up over the nice. years. Okay, next please. Um, I suppose now what's really most interesting is the new format which came up last year, which was of the virtual residency because come COVID and our artists couldn't attend residencies overseas, they couldn't attend uh, residencies in India as well. So we thought why not conduct virtual residencies, have a curator, so we started this last year. We got a, a, a curator, Virangana, to uh, put a program together. And I think it was a fantastic success. And now I see many variations of this, um, mm. of this model. In fact, next, please. Later in the year, we, um, at, the end, at the end of last year, we collaborated with Abbott. This was really a virtual art project called Blurring Boundaries, but it was exactly what a residency would have been. And um, in fact, if they have it online, you should visit it and see the work which came out of this. It was really quite amazing. And um, next space. And the sort of the latest kind of, this is again all about Blurring Boundaries. Um, next. Yeah. And now this is the latest format where this is a residency we're supporting at the moment. It's called the Coral Woman Residency. This evolved from a very successful film called the Coral Woman Film. And in fact, there's a children's book, which has also come out of this. And this residency, there is, um, uh, it's about raising public awareness. It's about uh, community engagement on uh, public issues, uh, I mean, on the issue of coral. And uh, next, please. So this for us is quite a new step because so far it's always been about the individual and about skin en enhancement for the individual. But this is about much larger issues. This is for social engagement. And um, so in fact, this is currently going on, this residency. So, um, we have the next slide, please. Well, that's the end of it. Okay. Um, other than artist residencies, we also support um, residencies at dance spaces like Gati and Atakalari. So, um, our commitment to residencies is uh, um, sort of all there because we find it's worked very effectively. Right. With no real end goal or a tangible return, um, you know, how do you measure success of a residency? I think, you know, it's, it's very difficult to measure success. A residency can be a month, it can be three months, it can be even a year. I mean, like, for example, Wright's Academy could be one year or two years. So um, I think the what we do believe in is... Um, getting feedback from the artist. So we get extensive feedback from the artist. And that is our measure of um, sort of gauging how successful it's been, how yeah. the artist feels about it. I mean, it's not possible for a one-month intervention or a two-month intervention to change your life completely. 
Right. But that said, even um, I, I'll give you an example. For example, we had an artist, Shashi Thadavuzo, who went to um, the Darling Foundry in Montreal. Mm. Now, from there, he went off. Uh, they arranged for studio visits and visits in institutions in Toronto. Mm. He came back and then he, he got commissions. He got offers to show at galleries. He's gone back since then. His practice took off at a completely different uh, uh, level. It would never have reached that kind of um, international stage had it not, had he not had the opportunity to. Right, uh, right. So um, I think the only way we can really measure success is by asking the artist how they feel. You sure. Know? We, um, we don't, sorry, we don't expect anything. Um, the, uh, our support at residencies is never outcome oriented. Hmm. We, don't, um, we don't expect them to um, produce a work of art. It could just be a series of conversations. And if that conversation, if those conversations benefit the practice, so be it. I remember uh, there was a young artist who was at What About Art, and he thought the best part of his residency was the conversations he had with Geef Patel, who mm. talked to him about music, about reading, about books, about literature. He said it was the best conversation he's ever had. And he had a formal education in art. So for us, it's, it's whatever enhances your practice. Right. Uh, I'm glad you, you spoke about blurring boundaries because uh, go to Vishwa, um, you know, I'd like to ask you here, like do online, like we spoke that we are now in a hybrid space and do online exhibitions do justice as replacements for gallery exhibitions? Is this a new form do you see as a collaborative art making? Um, so I... I don't think that they replace uh, gallery exhibitions because I think one of the most beautiful things as a maker, as a kind of person who makes art, is the materiality of it. To me, this materiality mm. is incredibly important and that goes missing in the digital space. Sure. Having said that, what one has enjoyed uh, as a viewer, as a kind of... is the accessibility that you know i could see exhibitions that i would have i there was no way of reaching even in non covid times um or to be able yeah. to listen to conversations that would not have been accessible in non covid times even in non covid times and so in that sense the digital space i think really allowed to be able to view things although i feel that experientially they are considerably different the other thing as far as SQW lab is concerned. I think our roles changed this time and I'm still in my head grappling with this and I would ask Roto to also follow up on this but um, because SQW lab and its normal pre-COVID times worked where Koto, Charlie, uh, Rosie and I also produced work and we also and this time that changed we became facilitators and this is a new role for us to be just facilitators. I mean, Charlie is used to it. She's a curator and she's used to it. But for the, the other three of us, we kind of, for the very, I think for me, at least it was a very first time that I changed roles where I was not directly in collaboration um, and just collaborating at a very different way. And I am not yet sure, you know, how this is going to impact both SQW Lab as well as my own practice. Sure. I mean, there has been a dramatic impact on artists and livelihoods and, um, you know, with so many cancellations, postponement of shows, galleries closing down, you know, um, businesses, the, it's, it's even affected the publishing business. Um, you know, is there, I mean, and this is a, this is a question to everybody here, is there, is there a coming out of this? like back from the losses that have been incurred? Or how do we see ourselves transitioning? 
and adapting to this new way of being. And I, I um, I think that uh, yes, there is a comeback in the last few 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 months, at least here in uh, in Italy. I don't know if uh, this is a worldwide issue, uh, but uh, according to me, people have uh, recognized um, the, the the value and the. Um, the, the the pleasure of reading or uh, or having a, um, uh, an exchange with uh, with the form of uh, of art and the literary projects uh, uh, like like uh, Bridge of Stories uh, uh, being one of them uh, um, are coming back. Uh, uh, there are new magazines, new publishing house uh, that are springing up, uh, and. Um, uh, I think that the, the book market uh, has started to, to, to grow again uh, and we, we all hope it, uh, it, it will last. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's true that the, art, the artists uh, have um, paid in uh, monetary terms uh, for, the ex for this uh, exclusion of uh, this detachment from reality uh, during this, uh, this time. But, one thing that I truly believe is that uh, uh, that the, the people are realizing that we need uh, uh, quality uh, on the on the look on the on the gates uh, of uh, of those who uh, who are in charge are in charge or trying to uh, describe the world uh, the world to 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 ourselves because um, uh, telling the world uh, is like. Uh, uh, changing it in some in some way. So if we demand the, the quality uh, of the of this uh, of this this art, uh, writing or uh, uh, visual uh, visual art, uh, uh, then uh, it seems like we we are we, we are doing it now. So in, uh, in some terms, right? Um, you know how else um, you know has the projects have projects evolved in a post pandemic world aside of the fact that things have moved digitally in in all of your experiences like have new projects emerged you know new practices sure so i think you know we would not have, for example, done the show windows had it not been the pressure of not I mean to say, you know, to do without having our regular format. So that kind of forceful switch has definitely led to something else, which you know, that's something we never thought of doing. We never thought of a public art project for SQW Lab, or we never thought that we would be only facilitators. And um, that is definitely, I think like for both Goto and me and Goto, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a like a nice kick in the butt that please get this done. Like, you know. um, so that's definitely kind of been an advantage and something that came out of being forced to do something because of the situation that was out of in our control. Can I, ask, can I ask you that one a little bit? So, yes, I think it's, I agree with Michelle that it's, um, the pandemic and in that situation really pushed us to um, do something com completely different format. But it's one, one hand that it, we had the opportunity to think about how to uh, organize without having the physical format. But it's the other hand that it, it was also uh, idea come from external and it was very um, concrete idea that it handed over to us to coordinate and then uh, deliver and, and in fact it's like when the pandemic started 2020 like end of march and april um, we had a difficulty kind of um, proactively doing from our side so we started with the um, small, small collaboration, working on competition or something that it's, we have a, a clear goal to achieve with amongst the people who 
working. So I think it's uh, still for us, SQW Lab um, haven't found our own way of doing the virtual things, but it's having the external uh, concrete goal, uh, we could kind of uh, you know continue doing. So still we are kind of finding the way around on virtual format, but um, as a know-how and the method, we started gaining how we deliver the uh, outcome and result. Right. So, sorry, I'm just going to a little bit add to Goto. It's also because I really feel, like I said before, that as art makers, as artists, somehow this materiality is important. And I would like to find that that balance of sure. how do you know within this how do you still bring make a material experience possible rather than just kind of shifting entirely uh, may i um, uh, sure. uh, sorry just just one i would like to add one, sure, one point so, so if we kind of uh, look at our own play project it completely depends on the physical interaction that the uh, collaborators, you know, come together and then stay together in one place and then work. So, uh, in fact, it's like the way it is uh, arranged also, it's a strict timeline to work, but it's a given brief is quite vague and um, open-ended. So we kind of expecting or kind of rely on the synergy when the people meet and they work together. But it's, I, we think that it's um, online format, we need a more concrete uh, programming. Right, right, certainly. Uh, yes, Sumana. I, as uh, Vishwa and uh, she was speaking, was speaking, I, I was just thinking about two things. I remember when uh, COVID first came to India, I was in the middle of a semester teaching students and it was an introductory course to creative writing. And I remember how after March, most of the writing that I began uh, seeing in the month of May, two months after the pandemic struck, um, how COVID had become a primary subject uh, for uh, you know my students, whether it was the stories or poems or graphic novels, oh, sorry, graphic narratives that they were uh, writing or creating. I think uh, at any given point of time in history, in the history of literature, art, culture, cinema, at first, the impact is on the content. And that is why there have been so many stories related to the impact of uh, COVID in, on our lives. Only much later, I think, do we see the impact of anything on form. So a form such as this one, where all of us could be sitting in different parts of the world, but have been assembled together on a computer screen, is a, is a form. Uh, it's a format, but we can't forget that the word format derives from form. So um, I can see uh, Amita, uh, you know, smiling, uh, I, I hope in agreement. Uh, it reminds me of the fact that Deleuze and Guattari, two of my favorite thinkers, um, how they subverted the hierarchies of the tree model by giving us a rhizome model. So grass, for instance, or potatoes, or, you know, turmeric, or ginger, where we are related to each other in this format and not in the hierarchical, uh, you know, uh, tree um, format that has been handed down to us. I think um, I agree completely with Vishwa when she says that, um, I hope I've got your pronoun right, Vishwa. I'm scared of messing up pronouns in this new world that we live in now. Um, uh, I, I think I, I agree uh, completely with her when she says that virtual residencies cannot substitute, mm. you know, the interaction of sweat and skin and the color of paint and, you know, the perfume of someone sitting next to you. But it is just another addition. It is N plus one. 
So while Amita will continue to support other kinds of um, residencies, she will also do this. So it's just plus N. What one of the things that I have liked about this uh, on this this online residency format, and uh, do uh, add to what I'm saying, Amita, because I want to know what you think of this, particularly as a woman in this position, is. It, it somehow, I think, in my head, it subverts a kind of hierarchy that has to do with location. Every location, particularly metropolitan locations, are coded with power. If we have residencies, sorry, if we have people who benefit from residencies who are in non-metropolitan or provincial spaces, um, it might add something to the quality of the work that is being created, not only by artists who are based in the metropoles, but also in the reverse direction. Um, I think such experiments gave birth to the culture of art in places like Shantiniketan and Baroda. Hmm. Uh, isn't it Amita and Vishwa? Uh, I mean, I, I, I hope that that will happen with, you know, so that an artist based in the small town where I am in will benefit from a conversation that they might be able to have with Vishwa or Amita, you know, without having to make this journey. That I hope will, you know, it will not replace, but it will add to this. Right. I, I liked, the, can I just come in here? Sure, sure, of course. I liked, I think Sumana put it very beautifully that uh, virtual residencies are really N plus one. It's an, it's an additional way of, um, of keeping it going. But, um, you know, when you have an open call for a residency, it's, um, it's not limited to artists from uh, the metropolis or anything like that. It's open to someone sitting in Siliguri. It's right. open to someone sitting anywhere. You could be in Kochi, you could be, I mean, you could be in any city anywhere. Right. I mean, th there is the larger issue of um, uh, whether the application would be as, um, would be as attractive as someone from, but I mean, so you, here you're talking about artistic practice. It's not, I mean, the artist, it's, it's, you have to be able to hold your own. But um, I, I think what the, the, the other really big plus point of a virtual residency is that you're able to interact with people from different geographies very easily. So, for example, I mean, the virtual residency, um, which uh, Virangana had organized, I mean, they had people from Germany, from uh, Pakistan, from all over the place who were uh, tuning in and uh, interacting with the artists. Now, that I see as a huge a um, uh, huge, huge plus point. You don't have to physically bring a person right. incur that cost. So that, that's a huge advantage. But um, the opportunity, I hope, is, is open equally to anybody from anywhere, as long as you, you know, fulfill the criteria, the eligibility criteria. But uh, in the long run, I think going back to the physical space is important. It's important right. for art in particular. It's, it's that whole, that tangible kind of, you know, um, you, you have to be able to feel, um, you know, just, just, it's more than just looking at it. You know, it, it's more than just conversations. It has to be, it has yes. to be. Uh, if I can jump in here, like Sumana, I, that was incredibly beautiful. Um, I think you got it, like you hit the nail on the head, if I may say so. And also, but I agree with Amita as well that it, it is important because, I mean, just for this conversation, you know, in our pre-conversation, we spoke about somehow within the digital space, our attention spans are lesser. And yeah. I at least find myself sometimes jumping because there's so much going on that suddenly is available that you kind of jump conversations um also in a day you you are in too many places at once and i feel that somehow the physical allows a slowness which is important at least to 
Yeah. I mean, I would like, like, I, I would, I like that slowness that allows a certain amount of time to think instead of too many things being kind of coming at you. And yeah. I've been wondering about this as to how do you find that balance? Because on the one hand, the virtual space is so great and the accessibility it provides uh, for all of us. But at the same time, it's also taking something away. And, and this balance is what I've been thinking about. Right. I think even though the world has closed, I mean, had closed borders, uh, it opened up in a very different way in a virtual world. But I think, um, I don't know, like, do artists feel this digital fatigue? Oh, so I have I been... It has busy. been one overall. I mean... Uh, Yes and no for me personally, because yeah. I have actually not engaged in that much. Um, the ones that I have are usually lectures that I would like to listen to, which, you know, sure. which has already been coming in the, in the formats of podcasts and mm. all the museums and all of them kind of putting up recordings on platforms such as YouTube's or their own websites or like this. And but there was a, an additional benefit that I could be there live and I could have my questions answered should I have any. And this, this kind of made a bit of a difference. <clears throat> but I think it was, it was uh, for me, not that tiring because I didn't engage with it that much. Right. Um, and I, I don't know, I think maybe, uh, you know, um, I actually want to ask Amita this because... <laughs> they actually conducted an entire residency online and then yeah. then did they face did the artists face uh, zoom fatigue well no one complained of zoom fatigue they asked for more they were they were so I hungry think. for interactions frankly right they were so so hungry for interactions they were so um keen on reviews they were so keen on having um, you know being exposed to different people it, 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 there was a certain richness to their interactions which um, um, I, I think just took them through mm -hmm. and I, I think it was like many hours a day for a month so um, no one complained I mean I, I don't think you can do it for a sustained period of time for many months but yeah, for a month, six weeks, I think it, I, I think it's the quality of the programming. Sure, it's, it's what you what you actually what your content actually is. How do you engage with people online? Right. You know, what are the kind of engagements you have with them, and that that's what kept it going. So no, no one complained <laughs> of digital fatigue at all. In fact, I think they felt sorry that they hadn't been able to round it up. I, I think Coach did a very interesting thing this time. They did a they did a virtual the peers um, residency which we also support. They did a virtual online session and then they rounded it up with a physical meeting at the end for the last two weeks or something. So I think that's a nice uh, sort of hybrid model you know. Right. Um, to be able to adopt. So I, I, I think at the end of the uh, virtual res there, there was this need for wanting to meet each other physically uh, not not minute. just on screen mm -hmm. uh yeah. sumana matteo you know are there similar trends that uh, both of you have observed in the literary world as i said reema um in answering kind of responding to your uh, previous question I think uh, the last year in particular, it's so hard to make this distinction in my head and I'm sure in all of us, um, this distinction between the two years, it just seems like one large bolus of time. Um, so in the first year, this is 2021, in 2020, um, much of the writing that came uh, from not just young people, a lot of writing, I think a lot of volumes, anthologies, even stories, a novel, for instance, by Siddharth, uh, Kashmiri, by this uh, Kashmiri writer Siddharth Gigu. Um, they all had to do with um, the impact of COVID. In fact, Siddharth Gigu's novel, I thought, was, a, uh, was, was, a, was an interesting uh, experiment because he was writing it in real time. He had 
decided he would begin writing his novel on a certain day when the you know much before the lockdown in india began and he kind of went with it and finished it in a certain period of time and got it published and, and so on now i think like zoom fatigue there is also a fatigue uh, about stories that carry this particular trope uh, what i am actually interested in rima is to see how this will affect the form as i said we can see this only very retrospectively after a few years have passed and we begin to see oh it was uh, you mentioned a shorter attention span amita mentioned something that i personally have felt you know after the residency you want to meet these people want to hug them you know like you do when you uh, say bye uh, you know before you wish to see them again uh, how does all of this these emotions these rasas that we feel how do they how will they affect the form in which uh the writing or art or cinema will emerge you know um it's not just um how do i say it without um uh, let me just try and try and paraphrase what's been on my mind for some time just as i say this to my students often that uh, for instance and i'm sure this is um, though this might be true uh, of the small town that i grew up in i think um, even amita will be able to remember a time uh, in bombay when not every household or uh, had a phone had a land phone so you know the neighbors used phones so it was not it was a wee phone so it wasn't the phone did not only belong to you people from the neighborhood um, and you know the other neighboring flats they used it mm. and then uh, when everyone so then, then there was the idea of the family phone every member of the family used what was called the land phone there's a reason apple decided to call its phone iphone you know the, the narrative of individualism is kind of related to how forms take my phone will only open you know to my fingerprint or whatever it's called mm -hmm. my so that the fact that technology and the rise of extremely a kind of narcissistic version of individualism drives literature and art and it is related to technology i am quite certain that our zoom lives will also affect so, you know will have an impact on the way artists like bishwa writers like matteo it will reveal itself in their writing even though we say oh i have i don't want to create anything that measures or you know shows the impact of covid hmm. but the lives that we have led in the last two years the format in which we you know for instance you ask this question about zoom fatigue oh yes i watch with my eyes closed i have not watched films for a really long time all i do is stare at the screen and preach to my students as if i was moses that's all i have been doing so i don't want to look at the screen anymore um, so what does that do to my idea of seeing as as a writer um seeing has been most important to my idea of creativity i've always felt that there must be a reason that the indian word for philosophy sorry the sanskrit word for philosophy even the bangla word and i think in hindi too is darshan the fact that you see that has influenced the way i write particularly my poems so what does this fatigue in the fact that i don't want to look anymore i close my eyes as often as i can to rest it how will that impact my writing and you know not just mine but others so those are questions that i want to uh, you know i'm a kind of literary detective and these are things i want to so if i'm looking at bishwa's work i i want to look at her work before 2019 and her work after that to see the difference that i'm sure she doesn't feel consciously as an artist no artist does mm. no matter how intentional they might be Yeah, uh, but to see these differences. That, that means you can only observe in hindsight. Yes, yes. Right. 
Right. Uh, Mateo, would you like to add something to what uh, Sumana has so beautifully uh, constructed? I completely agree uh, with, with uh, what she beautifully said. Uh, but I, I think that literature uh, serves to to ask to uh, to ask us questions, not 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 only to give us uh, answers, answers that are not uh, uh, possible right now. Uh, literature and culture as well serve to ask. Uh, um, ever more and more intelligent questions in order to arrive to something that uh, really uh, really is important to us. Uh, for me, uh, it's not changed, um, not, not much has changed because I am, I am always in front of, um, of a computer uh, writing or speaking or teaching. So it's only the, the, the project are, have increased so so much. I think that the the the, the COVID will be uh, should be a, a character in our in our writings in my writings. Uh, I can uh, completely uh, choose to ignore him or treat it like a, only like a literature thing. Uh, I think that our aim uh, is uh, to create create our words where we can uh, uh, have it. My book, my, my new book just came out here, here in Italy um, and it's about uh, genealogy, but I think that ge genealogy is like a cosmology, cosmogony, you know, like a creation of a, of a word. And then you can, uh, you can choose, you can choose what word you can live in what word you are writing so i i try to teach uh, to my to my students uh, this uh, uh, this lesson and of course uh, virtuality uh, will never be enough for us uh, we i think that we um, must um, strive not to lose uh, the, the the closeness uh, between people like uh, sumana was uh, was uh, was saying for saying but of course uh, uh, virtuality and the fatigue we we took from the from this virtuality is a is a good uh, substitute for the real fatigue. No, uh, for me the the the, the work is not uh, is not changed. Uh, so virtuality works very well, but uh, it cannot go as deep as a, a live meeting. Um, that's the. That's that for for this. Uh, um, for example, uh, our um, our uh, residency have uh, uh, the aim to, uh, to to publish a real book that you can physically touch and uh, buy in uh, in the bookshops. So uh, I think that the, the virtuality of this uh, residency, this cultural project, uh, will uh, will uh, can should serve uh, like a starting point uh, for uh, future projects. Right, right. And, and that would be so critical, Amita, to uh, theater and dance residencies that uh, uh, in Lax Shivdasani Foundation supports as well. Um, sorry, I missed that last bit. <laughs> I said this would be so critical to even dance and uh, theater residencies uh, that uh, in Lax Foundation supports as well. Yeah, it would. Um, I, I think going forward, we just have to see which way, um, I, I, as, as things open out, I think we will return to the old formats. Um, um, but I think we'll always have this new way of interacting. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's a huge plus point. So that always becomes an additional way of interacting even within the old format. Right. You know? right. So I, I think that's the way forward. Sure. Um, on that note, I'd like to uh, open this um, you know, discussion to questions from our uh, audience. Um, so the first question would be, uh, by an anonymous attendee. <laughs> Do you think online residencies have the power 
to democratize the concept and practice of conventional residencies, thereby evolve, involving a wider set of artists, curators, etc. I think the last, uh, um, you know, few minutes we've been discussing precisely this. Uh, are there any other thoughts that we'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, Vishwa. <laughs> but what it is is also the small interactions, right? Like if if this panel discussion was say at a physical venue, um, we would have a separate discussion before and after as well over chai or. Um, and, you know, there would be these smaller conversations that go on between the audience and the panel and between the panelists and the panelists and the organizers. And it's the same with any general party. And this, I think, is important to me and to use Sumana to kind of paraphrase Sumana in a way that where she uses this iPhone and the telephone analogy, you know, where the space around our <clears throat> homes, where, you know, there was a designated space for the telephone and you met around there or you went to that STD booth and that STD booth became the kind of calling it STD booth now sounds so bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> it sounds, you know, it became the meeting place. You kind of mm -hmm. told your friend to meet you there to call another friend. Correct. Um, and in that moment, you had these other small interactions, which were perhaps important. Whereas the, the problem of the, the Zoom format or the online format is that it's very formalized. The inf, you know, you kind of end it and then it's over. There is this conversation and then it's over. And I find that that is somehow taking away from the way in which we think about things. Right. And I, I really, I really wonder how that is going to impact not just, you know, artists and creators and dancers and writers and filmmakers. I think it's going to have a, a larger impact on. Because, you know, if I'm, if I am in a studio with, say, someone now, she might write on top of something I have drawn or, you know, this happens. Yes. So, you know, one wonders how this will Im impact. And it's, I feel also it's too early to say whether it's good or bad, it would be. Right, right. I miss the humor most, Vishwa. Uh, yes. laughing together uh, that really happens i mean it's almost like you know there are cues and you know we laugh but it's half-hearted laughter it's it's a smile trying to be a laugh we don't laugh and fall on each other and we don't slap each other on you know each other's yeah. backs um one thing i want to add in response to this question uh, Rima, the first question is that I do think there is the possibility of democratizing uh, something, particularly for women. I do know of two people, for instance, who could take up these virtual residencies because they have um, children to raise and they would not be able to do that had it been a real residency. So I think as a woman, um, uh, this is one thing that, you know, I, I have felt good about. Uh, this girl named Priyanka, um, who's just given birth, you know, a few months ago, she could take up this residency because yeah. she did have to travel. So uh, those are things I think that will help, you know, a certain group of people. Right. Uh, I think the next question by Saloni Dalal, I think Amita, you and Vishwa could answer this, maybe. How does an artist apply for the artist residency? You want me to go first? Um, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, basically, most residency spaces um, announce their calls. They put out their calls. So you've got to know where you want to go. And uh, you keep watching their website. Now, for example, our website, we put up all, I mean, naturally, we have mailing lists and all. But if you go to our website, often enough, anytime there's a call, you you can respond to it. Sure. Um, so, so basically, it's through internet, right? 
It's Correct. through the internet, through word of mouth. And um, everything is very freely accessible today. I mean, th that's the great democratization you talk about. It's, it's all easily accessible. 100%. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, Vishwa, the next question is by uh, Jagan Nathan. It's directed at you. Do online residencies foster a greater degree of cross-pollination as opposed to physical residencies where artists are probably more invested in the mechanics, the mechanics of their own practice? So I think I kind of already answered this one in my conversation with Sumana. But I think that, yes, on the one hand, yes, as an introduction to each other, it's great. You know, I can peep into your house and know a little bit more about you than I would if I was a stranger that I met you at a bus stop. But what the residency also does is allows you time and like almost a dedicated time and space to meet and to meet a group of people that have been put together for a reason. And I feel those informal conversations are, um, are the crux of residencies. Right. They kind of, as much as, uh, you know, just this kind of formalized conversation is extremely beneficial and going, you know, and this, but I think that those kind of informal slaps on backs, the relationships, the bonds you form during residencies, I've made lifelong friends on residencies, Charlie Levine being one of them. Um, right. So, and you know, that if from 2012 until now, like Charlie and I, have continuously done things together, whether they were personal things or whether they were, you know, work things or whether they were programming things or whether it was us going out shopping. But that that relationship that you build, I am not sure if that kind of cross pollination is possible through Zoom. I'm really unsure of that. Having said that, of course, it's it does allow for greater number of people from greater geographical locations to be able to access the content. Right. Um, Matteo, the next uh, May I just add a kind sure. of metaphorical analogy to what Vishwa so beautifully right. said? Uh, the idea of cross-pollination, I think, um, in real life interactions is unexpected and always aleatory and accidental. So we don't know whether it's going to be, if, we, if I may use the moral categories, good or bad, but something generative. Um, online residencies, if I have to continue with the analogy uh, that the questioner gave us of uh, cross-pollination is a bit like eugenics. People mm. are forced together and to create something. So there is a difference, of course. Accidents rarely will happen. Um, in such a setting. Art, I think, thrives through, you know, is a rich harvest of accidents always. The best art, I think, comes from those spaces. Just sorry, yeah. I, I also want to kind of contradict myself a little bit uh, on this as well, that, you know, all of that. But one of the things that the virtual space has done is that with uh, the show windows, what we also explored was this um, augmented reality, what they call the AR VR space. Um, and, you know, had it been a physical one, we would have never even thought about it. Like it's so out of our imagination, so to speak, at least mine, that we would have never thought. And, you know, we were able to bring Smartify on board and, kind of, and they were able to support us in making ARVR presentations for all our artists to make ARVR artwork, which is a space that is very new to me. And that has been a definitely very interesting space. So while I still feel that the result of that as an artwork is very naive, I, I do feel that there is something there that, that might allow um, a very different format of cross-pollination to happen because it was the first time that I'm working with people who are incredibly serious about technology, whereas mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I can barely get myself on a Zoom call. Yes. So, <laughs> so those, those kind of unexpected pollinations are, are definitely more 
made possible by this format. Sure, sure. Uh, Matthew, the next question is at, directed at you by Pratap Bodhapati. Telugu language is called Italian of the East. Being a Telugu speaking person, I'm tempted to ask, uh, did you come across any upcoming Telugu literary persons who require some type of support or you have a system that will benefit them? I, I don't know if I uh, understood clearly. I did not know that the um, Telugu language is called the Italian of the East. Uh, I, I will check. I will check on this. Uh, this later. Um, no, um, I did. I did not. Uh, I made my work only in uh, in, in Italian. So uh, it's, uh, maybe Sumana can answer this. One of our contributors uh, writes in Telugu and Kannada. So, yeah. Lovely. Um, sure. Uh, the next question is by uh, Tim Hoffman, bringing two geographically distant points together has been facilitated by internet. Um, the formal stylistic distance between the arts of space, that's architecture and time, can maybe more easily bridged when the two proponents are in separate spaces, able to concentrate on bridging and interests. I think this was more of a comment than uh, uh, a question. Um, Amita, the next question is by Avantika Baba, and this question uh, is for you. What if any, sorry, what if any are the opportunities Okay, what are the opportunities for artists, writers outside of India or in India that in lack supports or creates collaborations with? Uh, how might you see an expansion of this? Um, well, actually, we don't. We, we, the, our support is the other way around. Uh, we, it, it goes outwards. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's giving Indian artists the opportunity to um, uh, get an experience overseas. So we don't really we'd have we have no programs to support uh, people in the diaspora coming back and working here. Or that's not really our mandate. We haven't really got there yet. Sure. Um, so unfortunately, that's the position. Right. Uh, this is by Jagan Nathan again, and this is a question for anyone on the panel. Do you see online residencies covering a greater number of artists? Since the cost incurred would be lower than a physical residency where numbers have to be capped, which is not as significant a factor in an online residency. Any observations? Uh, so sure. two things I, I, I kind of want to answer this in reverse. I feel that the cost incurred are the same, more or less. I do not feel that the cost incurred decrease because of online. Um, that is one thing. It feels that way because, but you're still paying for a lot of things. <laughs> You may not be paying the artist directly, but you're paying for a lot of other things. And um, so I do not think that the costs are decreased, particularly in an impactful way. They're mildly less, but not in an impactful way. I also feel that um, as an, if I speak of this as an artist who is on a residency, um, the greater number of artists there are, yes, it's a lot of fun, but perhaps the selection process is important here and maybe Amita can uh, you know, highlight, talk about this a bit more, but um, I find that when it is a select group of people that has been put together for a reason that somehow the, it has a larger impact both on practice as well as a, an, in terms of a longer term collaboration. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and so, um, and then as an organizer as well, I feel that if I'm organizing, I would, would want to have, so with SQW Lab, it, it becomes a very peer group conversation. And if we try and do more than 
you know, four artists or six artists at a time, then it would it would be something that we would no longer be able to, you know, it wouldn't be satisfactory conversation for anyone, especially on the online format. Right, right. Um, but I mean, Amita has more experience with. No, just just want to jump in on this cost thing. I mean, we found that online is considerably more economical. There's a huge difference because um, in, an, in a physical residency, you're actually transporting the participants, you're paying for living expenses. It's much more expensive. Sure, sure. Uh, comparatively, the tech kind of uh, outgoings are less. I mean, that's in our experience, but it could be different depending on how it's put together. Right, right. Um, um, I, I, I get what, Vishwa, what you say, but, you know, a lot of um, residencies we find are thematic. So um, then it's, it's a, a lot of it is then matching the artist to the theme. And, and a lot of them have to put up proposals. They, they're, they're, they're responding to the themes, right? And, they, and, and their um, proposals talk to, the, talk to the subject. So um, it's putting, I think putting together a, a selection panel is really one of the most challenging um, aspects of the residency, of finding that right match of being able to um, um, find the right participants because the person then has to go and, you know, sort of function at so many different levels, you know, um, with peers, with the organization, whatever. So, so that's a big challenge, putting the selection panel together. I have to say that. Right. Uh, I'll combine two questions here. One is how difficult it is to coordinate and organize an online residency as they are primarily based on human interaction and influence. Can virtual exhibitions of work have the same impact, reach and experience as physical gallery exhibitions? Oh, yeah. Who wants to go? <laughs> I mean, I don't think the physical can ever compare with, mm. right? you can't compare the digital with the physical. But the reach, you can you can exponentially increase that as we did in the blurring boundaries. Yeah. Sorry, I just jumped in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but on, that, on that very positive note, uh, we need to wrap, we're, we're closing in. Uh, but thank you guys for such a wonderful conversation. I, and this panel, you know, we put it together with such, such in, interest and intent in dis, different different conversations. I mean, Rima, to start with you, thank you for so skillfully uh, moderating the session. And you started by quoting Atul Kumar, who is the first person I called for this panel because mm -hmm. I really admire the work he does. And I kept saying, I kept telling you bring theater in because that's your first love. Um, and um, and you know, I was sitting in Hena, who's a friend of everyone's uh, in Tark, and we were chatting. She told me about this project. I said we've got to do something, and I said okay, we're going to fit it in our residency project. Project. So thank you, uh, uh, Vishwa and Goto and Hena and, uh, and the folks at Targ for, for jumping in and also supporting. Uh, again, we're all time collaborators with the Italian uh, Cultural Center. Uh, Francesca has been so, so forthcoming. And when she told us about this wonderful residency idea, first thing that went to my mind, I said, Jumpa Larry. For some strange reason in Indian Italian translation, um, but um, I, it was so lovely to to finally meet you, Sumana. I mean, your N plus one uh, theory, your 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 iPhone allergy, and you know, even hearing the way you speak, obviously you are a poet. It was very poetic. And and Mateo, thank you uh, for for joining us. And last but not the least, Amita. I mean, you know, she's she's made so many careers and so many uh, mm. uh, practitioners out of artists uh, through her life. And you know, our blurring boundaries project would not have happened without her. To be very honest, and uh, even Coral Woman, the resident she's supporting, is the book that we ever did um, based on. Sorry, I'm doing my own little shameless plug. But uh, to 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 um, 
to just one more thought of Amita's to, to close this conversation, she said, we should all be going back, and I make copious notes during the session, which I can never read, which everyone knows. Uh, so going back to the old physical spaces is what we all need in the old formats. And at Avid, luckily, we're just going to do that just before we, we end for the New Year. So on Saturday, we have something very different at the Opera House. We have a, a lovely uh, music and dance performance, um, Oju, uh, Ojugni Punjabdi, by the wonderful Manjuri Chaturvedi. So in case you guys are around, there are very few tickets left because of COVID protocols. We can only have about 50% uh, you know, capacity. So do check it out. Um, but uh, on that note, have a, have a wonderful rest of the year. Remember that learning never stops. And next year, hopefully we all all will be back with this wonderful hybrid that we've all spoken about because as i say online is going nowhere and the physical is what we all all really crave for so it's going to be a, a happy mix of both of them so thank you all uh, for being part of the discussion thank you to the audience for being here and have a wonderful evening good night thank you good night thank you